Hi everyone, my name is Jessica. I'm with St. Mary's County Library. We are so lucky to have uh, Chuck or Charles Holden here with us today, as well as Jerry or Gerald Poder. Uh, Chuck is a professor of history at St. Mary's College of Maryland. And Jerry is a professor of history and American studies at Lawrence University. They are two of the co-authors of Republican Populist, Spiro Agnew and the Origins of Donald Trump's America. Unfortunately, Zach wasn't able to join us tonight, but we are so excited to have them with us. This meeting is being recorded, the webinar, and will be posted to our YouTube later. Uh, we're going to try and have time for questions at the end. Any questions you have, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And at the end, we'll see how many we can get through. And yeah, are you guys ready to get started? Absolutely. All right. So just kind of, kind of start off. What made you want to write a book about Spiro Agnew, of all people? <laughs> Doesn't everyone write, want to write a book about Spiro Agnew? Well, that, that story begins actually several years ago now when Zach Massetti came to St. Mary's College as the first director for our Center for the Study of Democracy, uh, which, we, which is still going strong at the college. Um, Tony Ugas is the director now, and he does a terrific job. Um, but Zach came, and I was on the advisory panel for the center, and so we got to be fast friends just right away. He's a political scientist, I'm a historian, and, and so we started talking right away about, let's, let's find something to work together on. And yeah, batted around a couple of ideas. We both were working on other projects at the time, but but uh, one day, um, stopping over to see if Zach wanted to go for coffee, he, uh, he kind of looked up from his desk and he said, Spiro Agnew. And I was like, yes. And, and what we sensed was that here is a guy, we wanted to do a Maryland topic, since we're in Maryland. Um, and, um, and here is a guy who'd been vice president of the United States. Um, he, he resigned in disgrace and then was just poof, he was just, just ghosted. And we thought, surely there's, there's more to that story. Um, and so we, like I said, we were both working on other, other projects at the time, but we kind of kept that idea floating around. And, and finally, we were able to have a, a, a sit down conversation with Ben Bradley of the Washington Post, um, who was a great friend of the college, and Richard Cohen, who was a journalist for the Washington Post, uh, and who back in the 70s had been on the Maryland beat. So he had been covering Agnew. And we got them talking about, about Agnew and, and Zach and I came away from that thinking, oh, this is, this, is really, this is really exciting. So by the time we got to about 2012, 2013, um, both of our, Zach had left, he'd gone on to Oklahoma uh, and, then, and then to Ripon College where he is now, where he's the president. We've, our schedules had aligned to where to where we thought, you know, this this could turn into a pretty neat uh, book project, uh, and that's that's where we then brought Jerry. And Jerry, if you want to talk about how you and Zach then came oh, together. Right. Right. Uh, well, I teach at Lawrence University in Wisconsin, uh, which is only about 45 minutes away from Ripon College, where Zach is a president and uh, political science professor. Uh, Lawrence and Ripon are actually uh, friendly rivals, uh, certainly rivals on the athletic field. Uh, and uh, uh, because of the proximity, uh, Zach and I got to know each other uh, uh, and uh, began talking about Ag. Uh, uh, and I was looking for a project that reflected what was going on at the time in American politics, which was actually the Tea Party at the time, or the residue of the Tea Party. This is a little before uh, Donald Trump. Uh, but I think the three of us, and Zach got me in contact with Chuck as well, the three of us realized that if you want to see the roots, if you want to understand the roots of what was going on in American politics on the right uh, at that time, uh, the populism, the anti-elitism, well, where, where do you find that in American history? Well, it goes straight back to Spiro Agnew. And of course, on uh, November 8th, 9, 2016, uh, the night that Donald Trump was elected president, we realized that, that Agnew was more important than ever. Uh, and in fact, I remember, I guess it was the 8th or the 9th, the, maybe, maybe the morning of the 9th of, uh, of November, 
uh, I emailed both Chuck and Zach saying, our book got a lot more important over the last uh, few hours. Uh, and I think that's how I uh, came into, uh, into the project as well. So it was not only uh, an interest in Agnew as a Marylander, uh, and as Zach and Chuck always point out, uh, Spiro Agnew was the only Marylander uh, ever elected president or vice president, uh, the only one to achieve that office, but also to understand the populism and anti-elitist elitist impulse that was running through the country at the time. And then, what kind of research do you, how long do you spend researching before you even begin writing the book? A long time. <laughs> uh, so historians, uh, we deal with what are called primary sources. And primary sources are those sources that are of the period, whatever period of time you're studying, right? So for, for so that's, that's where that really drove uh, the, the research for the book. Um, like I said, Zach and I had started kind of noodling around with this idea. We wrote an article for Maryland Historical Magazine. Um, but like I said, we didn't get really serious about it until like 2013, 2014. Um, and the, the kind of research we do basically is, is finding primary sources. So these days, newspapers, news magazines, a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Baltimore Sun, um, they're, we can access them through databases that, that, that'll take you back to the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, those, those critical years of Agnew's time. News magazines from the time as well. Um, like I mentioned, Zach and I got to, to do this, what amounted to an oral history with Bradley and, and Richard Cohen I did another oral, oral history with, with a gentleman named Stanley Fine, uh, who had, uh, as he was transitioning from college to, to law school, drove Agnew around during the 1966 race for governor. And so, you know, knew him. And that was a fantastic, a really fascinating oral history. Um, so we spent, you know, all three of us, as we like to joke, all three of us have day jobs, right? <laughs> And that, you know, whether it's Zach as a president of a college or Jerry and myself as professors, you know, uh, for Jerry and me, you know, our college kind of expects us to show up and teach for nine months out of the year, which, you know, cuts into being an historian. Um, so it meant that the research took uh, over a span of years, even though most of the, that time we were condensing it into maybe, you know, a month here and a month there and you know, so um, so it does take a long time, uh, and and good historical research should take a long time because you, you want to really comb over those sources and make sure that you've you've found the most relevant and appropriate ones, and and that you're you're getting the full range of what the primary sources are telling you and what they indicate. Because you know, if you find a hundred primary sources about a particular topic. And, and you're wondering, well, is it going to be A or B? You know, you're not going to find a hundred of them that say it's A and there you have your answer. It's going to be, you know, 70, 30, right? But you need that kind of mass of, of primary sources to tell you, okay, the bulk of the primary sources tell me that this is, this is the conclusion I should draw, right? So that too accounts for, for why research takes uh, such, such a long time. And that's even before we start writing. <laughs> And I would also add, uh, Chuck spent a lot of time uh, with the papers themselves, which are at the University of Maryland. And that, of course, was invaluable, where, you know, uh, uh, where you actually spend the time in the archives, you sit with the books, or the boxes, basically, and, and all of us who, uh, who do historical research, you know, you know, the, the people bring the boxes in, they're full of file folders, and you go through them, it takes a long time because much of what you are reading is irrelevant. Uh, uh, and the task of a historian is to figure out what's relevant and what's important and what's convincing. And uh, Chuck did a lot of the, of the legwork, the yeoman work uh, uh, in, uh, in the Agnew papers in College Park. So you guys had a lot of different resources, huge variety. What would you say were the main sources that you used more than anything for this book? <laughs> 
so the the main sources would have been the for trying to capture um, you know Agnew's significance, especially as he as he ends up being Nixon's vice president, his 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 impact, his significance on the national scale. Uh, you know, we use you know we use the Washington Post, we use the New York Times, we use the Wall Street Journal, uh, but we are also able to access through uh, databases like newspaper archives. We also wanted to know how Agnew was playing, so to speak, in in Boise, uh, in Des Moines you know, in Tulsa. And so we were able to access those newspapers as well. That was, those were extremely helpful. Uh, just again, kind of getting a sense of, of, you know, how is this playing outside of the Beltway, so to speak. Um, Jerry mentioned the Agnew papers in the, in the Hornbake Library at the University of Maryland College Park. And those were a tremendous resource. You know, the guy, the guy ends up being the vice president of the United States. So his, his collection at, at College Park is massive. It's just immense. Um, and, and I, you know, I, we did, you know, a lot of, spent a lot of hours looking through those folders and those letters. And, and in some ways I still feel like, you know, Jesus, there's, there's so much there. We, we just, you could spend the rest of your life looking at ag newspapers. And as Jared said, sometimes you, you just got to make some decisions. All right, this is, this is what I'm going to go with. Um, well, there's one chapter in the book um, that looks at Agnew's contribution to converting white Southerners to leave the Democratic Party uh, and join the Republican Party in the late 60s. And for that chapter, I drove down to Clemson University, uh, where Strom Thurmond's uh, papers are. And, and Strom Thurmond, some of you will remember, was, you know, very, very conservative um, South Carolina senator for forever, seemingly. Um, but he was significant for, for our story here in that he was one of the first big name Southern conservatives to leave the Democratic Party. White Southerners had been part of the Democratic Party going clear back to the Civil War. And if that's confusing, just remember that the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. So <laughs> enough said there. Um, but people like Strom Thurmond were one of the first big name Southern conservatives to leave the Democratic Party. And so people like Nixon then were very, very interested in cultivating a relationship with a Southern conservative who was now in the Republican Party. And so I wanted to look at that. There was a, one of Strom Thurmond's um, assistants was a guy named Harry Dent. And Harry Dent ended up as almost like the Southern liaison, if you will, for the Nixon administration. His papers were down at Clemson as well. And they gave, gave us a tremendous uh, insight into the kind of the thinking of these white Southern conservatives and why would they be drawn to somebody like Agnew? So, uh, so those are the main archival sources that we used. Right. And, you know, as we said, newspapers, magazines, anything that's contemporaneous, and also secondary sources as well, you know, books that had been written. Uh, there were a couple of books, I guess one book that had been written about Agnew uh, previously, uh, uh, ours is better, but you know. <laughs> uh, 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 but you know, you consult the, the, the secondary sources, uh, especially to tell the larger story here, which is uh, uh, the, the role reversal, what I called in my chapter, the role reversal between the Democratic and Republican parties that took place uh, over the course of 40 years between the New Deal and then the 1960s and, 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 and 1970s, uh, where uh, the Democrats go from economic populists to cultural elitists, and the Republicans, at least in terms of their ish, image, go from uh, economic elitists to cultural populists. And to tell that story, there's a huge amount of secondary literature as well, going back to the New Deal. So with all this research, what surprised you guys the most? Just really surprised you or shocked you? Mm -hmm. um, three things um, kind of come to mind as I, as, as, as I reflect back on this. Um, one of them was that, well, actually the first two are, are related now that I think about it. One of them was that Agnew had a, a much keener self-awareness of himself as a political figure, um, it, much earlier than, a much savvier one than I would have expected and way earlier if I expected one at all. 
So even before he's Baltimore County executive, you know, there is this, he has, he has kind of found a niche in Baltimore County for a style of politics. And this is where I think, you know, I, I think in a, 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 our book does a good job of getting at the, the, the kind of temperament that he brought to politics, where he figured out that being very pugnacious, uh, that using this very fiery language um, worked well for him. And, and so he, you know, he had kind of, he had created a political temperament for himself in the early 60s that he never really changed all the way through till his, his resignation in the end, right? So that surprised me. I didn't expect to find that. So that kind of self-awareness of, oh, if I do this, I think it came pretty natural to him, but, but there is a self-awareness that this is, a way of, 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 this is a way of creating a path forward through Maryland politics. So that surprised me. Um, secondly, um, he's known for these, especially as he becomes vice president, these, the, these kind of these, these sort of outlandish speeches that he gives, where these, these, these alliterations just come tripping off the tongue. And, and, and to the extent that people wrote about Agnew at all, they assumed that, that he was just being sent out there uh, to, to just deliver these lines. He had some very skillful uh, speechwriters, William Sapphire for one, Patrick Buchanan. But what, what our research indicated, and, and I gotta give Zach credit on this one, was that Agnew had a lot more input into those speeches than, than I would have guessed, than I realized. I mean, Zach found some of the drafts of those speeches and you can see Agnew's marginalia, the notes he's making on the margins where he's suggesting edits and so forth. Um, so, you know, again, a kind of self-awareness of, you know, how he wants to present this material as well. Um, so those were the two, and as I think about it, they're really kind of related to one another. The third surprise, and I think this is just because he was, he had someone who had reached the level of vice president, was just the sheer volume of crazy letters that he got, you know, the conspiracy theorists, just... And Agnew, you know, Agnew seemed to be a magnet for these guys, uh, people, right? And and they're some of them are truly wild, you know. Just and they're all, you know, they're they're all very personal, you know. That, you know, you some some hardware store owner in in in, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, you know. Wait, why would the Illuminati be going after him? That's a good question. Just there was a lot of that 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 was. Yeah, I mean, you, you always, a public figure, you find a few kind of, uh, but boy, there was a lot of them in Agnew's papers. Yeah. <laughs> life, ends up a, life ends up a long day of research, I can tell you that. <laughs> and, and what I would say as, uh, as someone who is of a certain age, I think uh, alone among us, I do personally remember the 1968 presidential campaign. I won't tell you how old I am, but I do remember it. And what I remember about it in relation to Agnew uh, is the ridicule that he was subject to. Uh, there was an infamous uh, 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 television commercial, and Chuck has seen it. I saw it live. Chuck had to go to an archive to see it, but I saw it live, uh, in which there's a voiceover uh, of a man uh, laughing uh, over, uh, I guess, the word Spiro Agnew or the word Spiro Agnew for vice president. The man laughs and laughs for about 30 seconds. And then at the end of the commercial, it says, uh, uh, this would be funny if it wasn't so serious. That's the image that Agnew had in 1968, uh, an, an airhead, uh, uh, certainly a bigot, uh, uh, someone who was not a deep thinker. But what surprised me in going through his papers and these, these materials is that he actually was a pretty deep thinker. He was a deep thinker about the cultural and political trends of the time. Uh, he could see which way the winds were blowing in culture and politics. He understood that. Uh, uh, so he was not a lightweight. Uh, I think he was, you know, he may, he may not have been a, a, a deep political philosopher, but what politician is uh, uh, for his time, uh, uh, and for these kinds of national candidates, I think, I wouldn't call him a policy wonk, but he certainly understood policy. Uh, and that's what surprised me. Uh, uh, he was not a laughing matter uh, uh, as a political figure and even as, uh, I, as an intellectual figure. He was, he was worthy of being taken seriously. That's a great point. You know, uh, Jerry reminded me of 
looking at those speeches that Agnew delivers before he's anybody, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's a Baltimore County executive. That's not nothing, right? But he's he's on no one's national radar in 62 or 63 or 64. And, but he's giving speeches locally in Baltimore County. And we looked at those speeches very closely. And as Jerry said, we took them seriously. They deserve to be taken seriously because his analysis, his, his, he was already striking a chord uh, among kind of anxious suburban middle-class white folks. And his, his, his assessment of, of those anxieties, why they felt so pressed and rushed all the time was, was very insightful. And that surprised me as well. Uh, the three of you wrote, the how does writing a book with three people work? Well, you know, uh, uh, usually, at least in, in history, and I'm sure if there are three authors on a book, it's usually an edited collection. In other words, there are three editors uh, and they work together as editors. So I think our book, which was original writing from all of us, uh, was, was somewhat unique. And we got together, uh, 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 Chuck and Zach obviously uh, knew each other for a long time, uh, but uh, one side of the group was this like, this is as if we had known each other for 20 years. Uh, it really helped friends, uh, uh, which, which we were and are. Uh, and we were able to, I think, meet, meet in, in terms, meet our minds, basically. Mm -hmm. I, we always seemed to be on the same page. We took different parts of the book. Uh, but we always, I think, approached it in, in similar ways. And so uh, I wouldn't say it was just like one person writing it, uh, but if three could be as one, I think we were pretty close to that. Uh, it also helps uh, that, that uh, we're, we're, all three of us are interested in baseball, all three, all three of us are interested in all sorts of things. Uh, uh, once a year while we were doing the research, Chuck would come out to Wisconsin and uh, 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 Zach and Chuck and I uh, would go to, uh, to a, a Milwaukee Brewer game. Uh, we would drive down from Ripon uh, and, you know, we would talk in the car, of course, about the book and only the book and not about baseball, but uh, that helped us, I think, uh, bond to, you know, to an extent. And I would say that uh, if you read the book, uh, the book, I think, hangs together very, very seamlessly in terms of the writing style. In other words, it would be very difficult for someone or even someone who knew us to identify who wrote which chapter. Okay, we, we wrote individual chapters, but I, I think the book is seamless enough so that uh, we would have to tell you who wrote what. Yeah. Be a fun game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I noticed that reading, which is part of it is, it's just a very seamless uh, experience reading it, that it wasn't like instantly, oh, this one was written by this person and this one by that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, re it really hangs together. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, academics being the way they are, uh, you can start out friends if you're writing a book together, but you don't usually finish up as friends or don't always finish up as friends. We're, we're, we're still great friends. That's right. <laughs> it's good to hear. So having done all this research, written the book, did it change your view of Spiro Agnew? Well, you know, uh, uh, he is obviously a very flawed person. Uh, 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 at the at the end of the book, in the uh, uh, in the conclusion, uh, uh, I won't tell you who wrote wrote the sentence, but he cheated on his taxes. He cheated on his wife. He cheat, you know, he cheated in a lot of ways. So he is he is not necessarily the most uh, appealing personality, but. He is an important personality. And uh, as you do historical research, you don't get to pick and choose uh, uh, your personalities. You have to take them as, they, as you find them. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, I would say that uh, my view of him personally remained negative, but my view of him historically, uh, uh, I, I think he, he was a much more important historical figure, and of course that comes back to why we wrote the book, uh, than, than people had thought. Uh, uh, and I think that's being borne out uh, 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 today. I mean, we're, ours is not the only book uh, written about Spiro Agnew. Yeah, I, I, uh, 
my answer is very similar to Jerry's in that, that, that um, um, what changed for me was that, you know, I, I, you could see early on in the project that he was, that his influence was greater than had been recognized. Um, but within that, what changed for me was that he, despite his many, many flaws, he was in many ways a, a much more serious minded person um, than, than, I, than I would have guessed at the outset. Because, so, you know, some people, they reach a national level of political influence and they're still not very serious minded, right? They're, they're just in it for different reasons. Agnew himself, right, he became a Republican. He had a pretty big shift in politics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, this was, um, this was a, a matter of, of opportunity for him. Um, so he grew up in Baltimore City, um, you know, uh, in an immigrant Greek community, um, and, you know, fairly, you know, kind of working lower middle class, um, but from a democratic family. But after World War II, when he got, he was in the war and he, he you know, served very honorably there, um, he got back and he had his law degree. And it, this was post-World War II, right? So, you know, lots of, of uh, white folks were moving to the suburbs and he was too. So he was a lawyer moving to the suburbs and he thought he might be interested in, in you know, he thought that he might be interested in politics, but he wasn't, you know, how do you do this? And he asked one of his mentors, um, a, another lawyer uh, who had been appointed a, uh, a judge out in, in Baltimore County, you know, what, 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 um, how do you get involved in politics in Maryland? And the answer was be a Republican. <laughs> uh, Maryland was a democratic state and um, and so it's the kind of the big fish in the small pond syndrome. And so really it was, that was pretty much it. And so he did. So there, there wasn't any big ideological conversion in other words. Um, uh, you know, I think once he was into the Republican party, he was pretty comfortable there, but, but no, it really was. He thought, well, this, this seems like an interesting path forward. And so he took that chance. Yeah. Uh when uh, uh, Chuck and I were talking a, a couple of days ago, I, I, I mentioned the practice in New York State. I'm originally from New York City. Uh, and it's very similar to uh, Baltimore, uh, Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Uh, there's a very small Republican party. Uh, uh, they stay in their lane and they are rewarded by getting judgeships. Uh, there's a certain number of judgeships that the, the dominant Democratic Party will sort of dole out to the Republican Party uh, in New York, uh, uh, largely, you know, to keep to keep them in line, basically. And that's that's how that's how people in the Republican Party in a very Democratic city and state. That's how they get ahead. And that's what you know, that's what Agnew did. And, you know, I don't think Agnew's politics would have would have been all that much different had he stayed in the Democratic Party. I think his 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 politics uh, uh, were not necessarily influenced by him becoming a Republican, as Chuck said. Uh, that was just a practical move. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what impact did he have on Maryland politics at the state level? Uh, <laughs> not much. <laughs> um, I would say there there are some. He he. Well, for one thing, he showed that a Republican could could win a statewide election. Uh, there had been a, a Republican governor McKeldin in the fifties, but before that, uh, not many. Um, and so, you know, his opportunity came in, in nineteen sixty six. Um, the Democratic Party, and, and as Jerry mentioned, was was really uh, at, at, at odds with itself, with the more pro civil rights wing, um, you know, under Lyndon Johnson and Bobby Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey and, and George McGovern, um, um, you know, pushing for a more progressive uh, uh, agenda, and, and and the price of doing that was losing conservative Southerners. So you know, Maryland reflected that as well. Uh, that that kind of division within the Democratic Party, um, and they the Democrats nominated a, a full on you know segregationist in 1966. The Democrats did, and and Agnew realized well 
here's my chance. All I have to be is not him. George Mahoney was his name. And he had a shot of picking up the black vote in Baltimore City, the, you know, the Montgomery County vote, the DC suburb vote, and, and he did. So he showed that there, you know, there was a way um, to, for, a, for a Republican to win at the state level. Um, but as governor, he didn't have a long lasting uh, influence on state politics. Uh, in, in part, he wasn't in office all that long. So he wins the 66 election, so which means he doesn't take office until early 67. By the middle of 68, he's been tabbed as Nixon's running mate. So he's on the campaign trail after that. So he's really got the reins of, of the governor's office for about, I don't know, 16 months or something like that. Um, and, and then he's gone. He's, he's vice president after that. Um, now, within that period of time, however, he's got a democratically controlled assembly. And so, right, so he's gonna have to work with them if they want to get anything done. But they do have some significant accomplishments. Um, uh, during his, his governorship that Maryland um, uh, repealed the law that banned mixed race marriages, for example. Uh, which was, you know, pretty pretty progressive in in the mid '60s. Um, you know, the Supreme Court was was having something to say about that as well. But but still, um, they uh, they passed a Fair Housing Act, and what that speaks to is the long held practice of basically of racial discrimination in, in housing. Uh, they they passed a Fair Housing Act to to get rid of that. Uh, so that was considered a fairly progressive piece of legislation under Ag News Watch. Now, on the on the more conservative side of things, um, you know, he he got um, he got the, the the salaries for the police were raised, and that's kind of the law and order side of of Ag News. We're going to take you know we're going to take care of the, the blue line there. Uh, he also pushed to have the budget for social services. Um, lowered by several million dollars, kind of, you know, that, that, that the Democratic Assembly really wanted to have this fairly robust safety net uh, for, for the poor. And, and, and he, he pushed that budget down, which, which really angered um, uh, those Democrats who voted for him. But in terms of long lasting policy legacy in the state of Maryland, he, he just, he, he, there's not much there, frankly. Yeah. And so you mentioned, right, the Democrats who voted for him. He ran as a Republican, but he actually had quite a few Democratic followers, right? Well, he certainly had them when he was running uh, for, for governor. Uh, but that, in a sense, was almost fluky, uh, uh, because as Chuck said, uh, uh, George Mahoney uh, was basically George Wallace reincarnated in a in, in, in a Maryland guise. So, uh, uh, in fact, I have a, a colleague here at Lawrence who uh, grew up in the Maryland suburbs, and he said that his mother in 1966 uh, was uh, the head of Democrats for Agnew, uh, uh, you know, a local group where they were voting for him. So he did have a lot of Democratic support in 1966 when he ran for governor, but his real Democratic support really began when he ran for president on Nixon's ticket in 1968. And in many ways, Agnew was added to the ticket uh, in part to attract disaffected Democrats to the Republican Party. Uh, uh, you know, silent majority Democrats, law and order Democrats. Uh, he, he, was, he was the hook basically. Uh, uh, and uh, he was deliberately selected for that reason. Uh, and I think it's fair to say from our research that uh, Spiro Agnew attracted a fair amount of Democrats to the Republican Party uh, in 1968, uh, uh, enough to win the election. And the reason in part that we know that uh, is, well, go to the source. Probably the best political prognosticator around in 1968 was Lyndon Johnson himself. Lyndon Johnson knew the way the political winds blew and knew how to count votes. And supposedly uh, on his way to Nixon's inauguration on January uh, 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 20th, 1969, they're in the car together. Uh, and Johnson says to Nixon, 
You know, Agnew probably carried about five border and southern states for you. And with all the noise being made about Edmund Muskie, who was Hubert Humphrey's vice presidential campaign a, a candidate and who got a lot of great press. Again, I was there. Uh, he got a huge amount of great press. He was described as Lincoln-esque. Uh, uh, Johnson says to uh, uh, Nixon, you know, you know what state uh, uh, Muskie carried for the Democrats? Maine. Right. And that was it. That was his home state. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the relationship between Nixon and Agnew, how was it? Did they get along? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there wasn't much of a relationship there. Uh, it was, it was as, as Jerry said, it was very much a marriage of convenience. Um, Nixon, for what he wanted to do and for the type of, of voters he needed to attract, ended up making a very savvy choice in Agnew. Because we, you know, we tend to forget now <clears throat> that in 1968, early in 1968, the, perhaps as big a threat as the Democrats to Richard Nixon was George Wallace. George Wallace, the old governor of Alabama, the old segregationist governor of Alabama, is polling very well in, in, the, in the early months of 1968. And so, and so Nixon wanted someone who was gonna be able to kind of speak to that Wallace vote, that conservative Southerner anti-elite vote uh, without some of the, the rougher edges of a George Wallace. And George Wallace could be pretty crude at times. Um, so, um, in the aftermath of Martin Luther King's assassination, um, Agnew then, as governor, went to Baltimore. Baltimore was in a state of considerable unrest, as were many cities after King's assassination. And, and so Agnew is governor. He calls out the National Guard and so forth. And he calls for a meeting of, of Baltimore City's African-American leadership. And they gather, and this thing's on television too, and Agnew just lays into him. Uh, he just he, he's pointing his finger at him and saying, this is your fault. You guys are cowards and so on and so forth. They were furious, right? And they started to walk out almost instantly. Um, Pat Buchanan, who was, on Ag who was on Nixon's staff at this time, is watching this on television. And he perks right up. And he knows exactly what, what the appeal is here. That here's, here is someone, a suburban very you know, well-groomed, handsome man uh, who can say the kind of things that Wallace would say with a little more finesse, uh, and that's, that's what they wanted. So, so it was a marriage of convenience. Now, as he's on the campaign trail, um, you know, Agnew understands what he's there for, and he does it. Once they win, um, Nixon puts Agnew at arm's length almost immediately. Uh, which, of course, Agnew did not like. Uh, but, um, you know, Nixon correctly understood that Agnew had no foreign policy chops whatsoever, and Nixon had a lot. Um, and so, you know, um, and on the domestic th side, um, he also knew that, that Agnew had no national experience. He'd been, you know, a, a year and a half as a governor. Uh, so he was likely going to be in over his head as well. And then I think there's just kind of Nixon's basic for sort of ego and insecurities tied together. It's like, you know, like keep this guy away from me, basically. Uh, so, they, so they did not have much of a relationship at all, really. Yeah. Their staffs worked together fairly well, uh, but, but the two men themselves, no. Yeah. Buchanan, in terms of being a staff liaison, could yeah. work both sides of the street. Uh, uh, you know, he was on, you know, he was with Agnew, Agnew trusted him, and Nixon trusted Buchanan as well. You know, when Nixon was in the political wilderness in the mid-1960s, he, he had like maybe one or two people around him, uh, and one of them was Buchanan. So he really trusted Buchanan. But, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought was very interesting in terms of doing the research for this book that I didn't know, and it wasn't about Agnew, it was about Nixon, was what a strange, different, yeah. difficult person Nixon was. He probably was the strangest and weirdest American president in terms of his personality. So Agnew couldn't get close to him, but no one could get close point. to this guy. Yeah. 
No one, no one, you know, they always talked about Roosevelt and Reagan. You never really knew what they were thinking. You couldn't get close to them. Uh, they, they, they were Bill Clinton compared to Richard Nixon, who was almost inscrutable, basically. Even his closest aides couldn't understand him. In fact, I always wondered about the loyalty of his political aides because a lot of them were very loyal to him. Uh, and during Watergate, so they took the fall for him. Some of them did. And I could never understand that because personally he was so remote from them. Why would you know why would you want to die on a hill for, for a leader who's not even close to you? Well, that was Nixon. Uh, so Agnew was not alone in having a difficult relationship with Nixon. Agnew was known as Nixon's Nixon on the campaign trail and when he became vice president. And what we mean by that is when Nixon was running for vice president in 1952 with Dwight Eisenhower, he was the bad cop to, uh, uh, to Dwight Eisenhower's genial good cop. Uh, uh, he was the hatchet man. Uh, he was the staunch anti-communist. Uh, 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 he was, uh, 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 he was, the, he was the, the, the man or the candidate who in 1952 would make a speech uh, and criticize Adlai Stevenson, who was the opponent of Nick of, of Eisenhower, uh, 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 the Democratic candidate, and say uh, uh, Alger, I mean uh, uh, Adlai Stevenson, referring to Alger Hiss, who was a Soviet spy, uh, uh, you know, associating uh, Adlai Stevenson with uh, uh, with communism. That's the kind of thing that Nixon would do in 1952. Well, when Nixon became the presidential candidate in 1968. He wanted another Nixon, and that's why he chose Agnew. And Agnew, as Chuck said, understood that. Yeah. 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 So what ultimately became Agnew's role in the administration? So great question. I mean, policy-wise, not surprisingly, given what, what we've just said, almost no role at all, right? Um, I would say um, he was... He was one of the last hawks on Vietnam. Uh, so even, you know, by the time, well, even by 70, you know, Nixon is, is drawing down the troop strength and, and really trying to find a way to get out of Vietnam. Um, and Agnew was, was one of the last saying, hang in there, you know, don't let the communists win. Um, and and I I you know that may have, have have kind of put a kind of he wasn't the only one but he was one of the last few hawks in these in these kind of high level meetings about what to do about Vietnam, and you, it's not hard to imagine that 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 might have given Nixon a bit of pause here from from time to time uh, about how fast the the you know the withdrawal should should happen. Um, but um, but once Agnew figured out that Nixon. And had little administrative use for him. Um, that, and he figured that out pretty quickly. It was hard to miss. I mean, you know, you're, you're not getting your phone calls returned. You know, this guy's, you know, your, your running mate here. Um, Agnew, again, I think in a way that speaks to a bit more cleverness uh, uh, than, than meets the eye, basically went back out on the speaking trail. I mean, it was almost like the campaign never ended. And so, and so that's what he did. And, he, and so he has, you know, um, he had a very active speechy, uh, speaking uh, uh, agenda through 69 and through 70 and into 71. Um, and he was very good at it. He was very good. And, and Nixon begrudgingly um, accepted that this is, this is what Agnew can do for me. And it was good for Agnew too, right? Because Agnew is becoming a household name at this time. So much so that by 1970, I think it was, um, you know, they, they do those like People Magazine poll, or who's the most popular, I don't think it was People Magazine, but those types of polls are who's the most, who's the most well-respected man in America. And Agnew came in third <laughs> and he was behind Nixon and Billy Graham. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, you know, so that's, you know, that was his role. Uh, and he got it. He understood it. And, and like I say, in a way, it was like the campaign never ended. Just right into 69, right into 70. Uh, he's now working for the midterms in 1970 and, uh, and into 71. So 
Um, so, and, and in that capacity though, his, you know, his, the role is to, to shore up and expand that, that silent majority base, those, you know, the hard hat vote as they called them, we'd now call them sort of the Rust Belt vote. Um, you know, those, those white folks in suburbia who are looking out over the anti-war protests and the drugs and the rock and roll and the tie-dye t-shirts and saying, what the hell's going on? And, and you know, uh, and, and then especially as we've mentioned a number of times, those, those conservative white Southerners whose, whose daddies and granddaddies and great granddaddies had always been part of the Democratic Party, Agnew is, is, is reaching out to them saying, it's okay, come join us. Uh, and, he, and he was very effective at that. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, what, and I think Chuck, Chuck can attest to this because he, he, he was the one who did the research. If you look in Nixon's files, before Agnew started making these speeches, there's a lot of nervousness among Nixon's aides, you know, uh, uh, what is Agnew going to say? Is he going to, you know, there's a moderate Republican wing and the moderate Republicans in the party are like horrified by him. So when he goes out on the speaking trail, there's a lot of nervousness. What is he going to say? Is he going to lose his votes? And when he gives the speech, especially the famous Des Moines speech, where he goes after the media elites, and there's this out positive outpouring, this huge positive outpouring, that's when Nixon and the Nixon people know that they can use him. And, you know, the analogy might be, I'm, I'm, I'm a big sports fan, so I, I'll work in a sports analogy here. If you're watching a basketball game and a player on your team takes a really bad shot, you're going, no, no, but then it goes in. And you go, yes, yes. And that's what the Nixon people started to do. They realized his very powerful message uh, and that they could really, really use him. You know, the other thing about uh, Agnew, if you watch his speeches, he doesn't scream. He does not raise his voice. Uh, uh, and, and in many ways, that makes his speeches even more effective, I think. He is not a yeller. He is not an arm waver. Uh, and I think that makes his speeches even, even, even more powerful. All right. And uh, we have a couple minutes left. If you guys don't mind, we do have a sure. couple questions from uh, sure. the people watching. The first one is from Dylan. I kind of touched on this, but he asked, what was the impact of increasing popularity of George Wallace on the sudden rise of Agnew to national politics and the vice presidency? Well, it was... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Chuck. No, I, yeah, just, I mean, again, we forget... Uh, that Wallace's poll numbers in those early months of 68 were, you know, late spring, really until Wallace announced his vice presidential candidate, um, Curtis LeMay, who was a, ended up being a terrible choice, and, and the campaign then bottomed pretty quickly after that. But until that time, Agne, uh, uh, Nixon was really worried that, Ag that Wallace was going to pull off enough of those conservative Southern votes um, that, that, that he wouldn't be able to get past the finish line in electoral college. Um, and, and, and Wallace was really on a roll here uh, through the late spring and I'd say into the summer of 68. Yeah, so, he, was, he was really polling well. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than to be good uh, because uh, as Chuck said, when uh, Wallace introduced his uh, vice presidential candidate, Curtis LeMay, uh, who was a former Army Air Force general known for firebombing Japan uh, uh, during World War II, uh, and uh, a super hawk on Vietnam. Uh, the initial press conference went so badly uh, as uh, LeMay started to intimate that he might be willing to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam, uh, he made even George Wallace, as hawkish as he was, nervous. And the campaign really lost steam after that. Uh, and that was just a lucky, unforced error uh, that Wallace made that benefited Nixon and Agnew because they seemed to be calm. They seemed to be reasonable uh, uh, in comparison. And, and Agnew himself criticized Curtis LeMay, right. you know, said, well, you know, I, I would certainly not go that far. Uh, uh, so even he out hawked even Spiro Agnew uh, uh, and I think that was really the turning point. But Wallace had a tremendous amount of, of, of momentum. You know, at Wallace rallies, uh, uh, they would basically pass the hat. 
uh, 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 you know, to get campaign contributions, you know, like like you were at a religious service, you know, that we passed the hat. And he raised a lot of money that way. I mean, if you looked at the tapes of those rallies and, you know, had what people who were known as the Wallace girls, they would come, you know, with, you know, like wearing straw hats and, you know, with, and he collected a lot of money. And, you know, if you're Richard Nixon and you're watching that, uh, uh, you're getting very, very nervous because those are your voters and he's stealing them. That's right. There's one quick thing. There's uh, speaking of Wallace and this and his introduction of General LeMay. There is this was there's a very uh, an American experience, a PBS American experience on Wallace that's tremendous. By the way, it's called "Setting the Woods on Fire." But there is you can probably find it on YouTube. This the, the video of the the in, the uh, introduction to the press of LeMay and LeMay is going up there talking about how he would use anything, including atomic bombs. And you can see Wallace in the background, just like, oh my God, what have we done here? It's, it's priceless, really. So we also have a question from Tracy. Did Agnew have a group of rabid supporters after his Yes, absolutely. As far as everyone was concerned. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This is uh, actually, we can put this under the surprise category as well. Um, so um, Agnew's papers, when, when, so the story is that, that, that the legal case against him started to emerge in uh, late summer 1973, when, when it was clear that the feds were, were, had their eye on him uh, for tax evasion, for basically taking kickbacks on on, on public contracts, uh, you know, bridges and, and, and sidewalks and whatnot. Um, and, and he just said, no, this is just totally made up. It's just the press is going after me. It's these, these, uh, these liberal people in the Department of Justice are going after me, et cetera, et cetera. But he finally cops a deal and says, all right, I'm out. And, and uh, he pleads, right? Okay. I was shocked. So I looked at the letters um, in the fall, the months after he, he resigned. Uh, and there, I'm not exaggerating, there are thousands of letters. Uh, and by far, most of them are, you know, we believe in you, they got you, it's the press, it's the liberals, it's the commies. Uh, they were mad at Nixon. Nixon should have stood up for you. I mean, I would guess the ratio of pro-Agnew to, to anti-Agnew letters, I bet it's 90 to 10. And there are thousands of them up there. So that was really amazing. Yeah, that, I, I think that was a huge find by Chuck, you know, uh, uh, that he found these letters that really altered our understanding of, uh, of Agnew's post-vice presidential career because, you know, the party line is, well, he just sank like a stone. He completely disappeared. Uh, uh, and of course, later in his life, and, you know, he died in, in, in 1994, right? Uh, Six. Oh, 1996. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was an obscure figure at that time, but in the immediate aftermath of his resignation, uh, uh, he got a huge amount of support. And, you know, if you really want to want to know what happened to Spiro Agnew, Ronald Reagan happened to Spiro Agnew, okay? Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan basically replaced him uh, uh, by 1976 uh, uh, as the conservative populist candidate, uh, 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 the candidate who made inroads into the South, uh, and, and had appeal in the South. So he, in a, in a sense, replaced Spiro Agnew uh, uh, in that role. And that, I think, is when Agnew started to fade out. But in the immediate aftermath uh, of his resignation, uh, he was still very popular in, in, you know, in, 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 many, in many quarters. And of course, uh, had he become president, uh, 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 there would have been no Ronald Reagan, and that's how history goes in, you know, in some very strange directions. You know, a personal note, uh, again, I, uh, I was living in New York, growing up in New York, uh, when Agnew resigned, and there was not one single Agnew supporter that I knew of in the entire city of New York, okay? Not one. And so when Chuck unearthed all those positive letters, uh, it was interesting for me just personally and uh, uh, an indication of how bifurcated the country was becoming even then and certainly is now. Yeah, great point. 
So we have a question from Harrison. Uh, says particularly this is for you, Chuck. Uh, is there any connection that can be formed between the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and the politics? What was the last part of that? Let's see. Connection between the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and the politics that Spiro Agnew was part of. Hmm, boy. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> myself, yeah. Uh, no. Well, that's, that's definitely not Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party he's no. joining, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm hard pressed to you, you, you give me a couple of hours. I might be able to come up. With, <laughs> nothing's coming off the top of my head. That, that, right. that, that's a line that Richard Nixon would never forget. <laughs> <laughs> Probably cost him the presidency in 1960. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you know, the only thing that I can think of, and maybe this is a little tenuous, is that Lincoln believed in what, what, we, what historians call the free labor idea. Uh, the idea that someone, even if they're poor, even if they come from an obscure background, if they work hard, uh, can, re can attain respectability, uh, can be reasonably successful in American life. Uh, uh, Lincoln called it the right to rise. And of course, his own life, where uh, his own pre-presidential life, where he, you know, he basically came from nothing and nowhere and became a successful attorney, you know, even if he hadn't been elected president, that illustrated that. And I think Agnew believed in that as well. Uh, uh, you know, and Agnew, I think, would say that my life uh, embodied that as well. Born to poor immigrants, uh, uh, very marginalized. And here I am, you know, governor of Maryland, uh, uh, successful uh, vice president of the United States. Uh, I think maybe that is, is, is the connection. Of course, Democrats would say, well, Republicans don't have a monopoly on, you know, on that as well. But Lincoln really embodied it. So uh, 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 it's possible that, that Agnew would, you know, would look back 100 years and say, well, that's my connection to Lincoln as well. Good job, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> It says, as uh, someone else who was <laughs> contemporaneous with the 1968 campaign, he recalls uh, his father-in-law, a lawyer, said some years later, Gates scandal was erupting. They have to get rid of Agnew before going after Nixon. Can you comment on the circumstances? in law that degree of clairvoyance well david dederick <laughs> um, um yeah there is there is something there actually um because when watergate was closing in on nixon and we know this from his tapes and from the haldeman diaries and so forth that one of the things that he almost would joke about was well they're not going to get rid of me because agnew would be president i mean nixon himself was saying this um, and, and there does seem to be some suggestion that, uh, that, that, that the attorney general who finally kind of green lighted the case to its, to its conclusion against Agnew, Elliot Richardson, there does seem to be some suggestion that, um, that not that, that he was afraid of a president Agnew so much, but he, he just thought it would be a catastrophe for the country to have to have this this terrible situation where a president is gone while a vice president is under indictment or something like that and so that you know so he he you know there does seem to be some suggestion that that he that he wanted to really push the case against agnew um not so much because he's afraid of all president agnew just that the chaos that would ensue so i think i think you got to give the father-in-law a little Tip of the cap on that one. Yeah, it's it's definitely on on Nixon's mind, and uh, uh, in 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 a sense, he's he's viewing uh, Agnew almost as a human shield uh, uh, while while Watergate is 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 going on. Thanks, David Dederick. <laughs> and we also have a question from uh, Helen. Chatty, see Jennifer, and I'm gonna kind of combine them because there's a similar thread. So Helen asks, "What do we learn from your book that becomes relevant to today's politics 
And then Jennifer asks, how did Agnew foreshadow Trump? Similarities and differences. I, I think one of the things that, that uh, I feel um, good about, about the work we did here was, I think we moved Agnew's politics uh, away from a, an, an ideological spectrum. Is he a conservative? Is he a moderate? Is he a liberal? Um, and, and I think what we do is we show how what really mattered was a, 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 a kind of temperament that he brought to politics, where a, a kind of persona, if you will, where, um, again, it's the fiery speeches, it's never backing down, it's, it's anti-elite, it, it, you know, it, sometimes it slips into a little conspiracy. Um, and, right, I mean, I don't think I need to, you know, <laughs> explain too much about, you know, how, how relevant that has been uh, to our politics in the last five years. Yeah, you know, I, I, I would say, read our book. And if you want to know where Donald Trump came from, uh, uh, read our book. You will find out where he came from. Uh, and I think Chuck is right about getting away from the strict ideological politics uh, and uh, starting to look at mood or, uh, or sensibility. You know, the, the conservative thinker Russell Kirk once said that conservatism is a sensibility, okay? And I think that's what Agnew embodied much more than ideology, a sensibility, uh, uh, an attitude, uh, maybe some irritable gestures, but much more than ideology. And Trump, I think, also uh, uh, embodies that as well. I mean, you know, you can talk about Trumpism, but Trumpism isn't so much an ideology as a sensibility, a way of looking at the world, basically, a way of looking at the country, a way of looking at yourself. Uh, and I think if you want to know where that comes from, you got to go back to Spiro right. Agnew because his sensibilities were very similar, and That's his right. sensibility was you know, similar. We, we just saw we saw this over and over again. You know, the pundits trying to to figure out, um, um, you know, what what Trump's the conservatives, right? All these conservatives are turning out for Trump in huge numbers, and the pundits would say, "But he's not a conservative." And our point is, so what? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. All right, so we did go a few minutes over for hanging out and answering all these questions and being with us tonight. This has been a really interesting talk. I, for one, learned a lot. Great, great. All uh, right. We do have available in the library, as well as presumably from your local retailers, if you want to make notes and uh, yeah. little things in the margins, as I do. Uh, please don't do that in the library books, but... <laughs> I know it's tempting. Uh, and yeah, thank you guys again for being here tonight and doing this talk with us. Um, there will be a link, an email coming out later in the next couple of days for everyone with a link to the recording as well as a survey. Uh, the surveys are anonymous, totally optional. They just let us know if you enjoyed programs and would more like to see more of this from your local library in the future. Thanks for having us. Thanks, yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, a pleasure.